we go back a little bit <laughs> to, to, to the Big Bang Theory, which of course is that somewhere back in countless ages, uh, the energy of the universe uh, kind of scrunched up and went and created matter and it sparked uh, an explosion which then threw out all of the things that became the, the galaxies and the planets and all like that. And of course, we've all been taught about the Big Bang Theory, right? Well, even the Big Bang Theory is now being called into question. So what we think we know, we don't really know. Uh, we also know that going back into the 80s, I have newspaper, mainstream newspaper uh, clips, and uh, here's one from just 2013 where they sit, are discovering new worlds out there. Uh, it's really wild because uh, all of my life, and, and a lot of you guys are about my age or so, and you may remember all the science fiction movies of the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, and they're talking about rocket ships and blah, blah, and going to other worlds and aliens. And do you realize it was not until the 19, late 1990s, I think about 1999, that they finally, science confirmed that there might have been another planet out there somewhere, Okay. And, uh, but now, of course, we know that there's, uh, to, to uh, in the words of the late Carl Sagan, there's billions and billions of them out there, right? <laughs> so, how do we know about all this stuff, and how do we know about our own solar system and how it was formed? And I would direct you to the Sumerian tablets that uh, predate the Bible by thousands of years, and uh, probably we can know more about the ancient Sumerians uh, than we'll ever know about the ancient Egyptians or Greeks because the Egyptians, the Greeks, they wrote things down on papyrus and uh, scrolls that uh, were destroyed in wars, burned up, degenerated, fell apart. The Sumerians would etch their writings uh, in cuneiform onto clay tablets and then bake them. There's about a half million of them still in existence. So where are they? They're scattered in museums around the world, probably buried in the basement or up in the attic somewhere. And only about half of these have been translated. And then I don't have to tell you about the squabbles and the controversies that goes on over the translations. Um, just to make a quick point, uh, I was reading all of uh, Zachariah Sitchin's material for years and uh, I agree with those who say I'm not, I'm not supporting 100% everything he says and all of his translations or all of his interpretations, but I think in general he's on to it. Uh, there's a fellow named Michael Heisman who uh, has tried to say that, no, he doesn't know what he's talking about because he never, uh, in the Sumerian tablets, they never even mentioned the word Anunnaki. Well, I went back to the uh, material in Oxford in England of the original translations of the Sumerian, and I find out all the way through there, they're talking about the Ananu gods, Enki, Enlil, you know, and apparently Sitchin and others have simply pluralized it and said we'll call them the Anunnaki. So to say that the guy's uh, full of hogwash <laughs> just because he, he used the word Anunnaki instead of the Ananu gods, I think is, is kind of a stretch, and I think uh, it seems to be there's an agenda there. And this is, you're going to see this agenda all through this presentation, hidden history, things they don't want us to know about. So the ancient Sumerian tablets, what did they tell us? Well, they tell us that, uh, uh, by the way, they, as you can see here on one of their ancient steels, they had a, uh, already a uh, pretty good conception of our solar system and of the proper uh, proportions of the planets. How in the world they knew that? Because uh, Neptune uh, was only discovered in 1846, and they didn't know about Pluto until 1930. And yet they've got it all down these thousands of years ago. To me, this is really strong evidence that uh, they were doing more than stargazing. Okay, according to the Sumerian tablets, uh, the original solar system, uh, there was Mercury, and then there was uh, uh, Venus, and then there was this planet called Tiamat. Um, i take it back. There was Mercury, Venus, uh, Mars, and then this big watery planet called Tiamat. And uh, according to the Sumerian uh, scribes, this is the way the solar system then looked at that time. 
And, uh, but they talk about the war in the heavens and the fact that uh, uh, this, they, there was another planet up there, uh, Nibiru, the planet of the crossing, as it's called. And this is because Nibiru is on an elliptical orbit that takes it far outside of our solar system. And it comes around, uh, they, several of the scholars uh, believe that they were counting up uh, to be about 3,600 years. Every 3,600 years, it comes back through our solar system and dragging along a few moons and you no know, telling what kind of uh, uh, space trash. And uh, every time that happens, then it impacts the Earth one way or another. Uh, yeah, they, again, we're back to these newspaper clippings where they feel like that there is another planet out there. Uh, we can't see it because it's way out in the dark and it's on out past Pluto. Uh, but just more and more, they say, yeah, there's something out there. And one of the ways they know this is because of the perturbations in the orbits of the outer planets. So Nibiru comes swinging through and one of the moons uh, smacks Tiamat. Uh, it destroys half the planet, just turns it into rubble. And this rubble, though, continues in the orbit of Tiamat. And this is what we now know as the asteroid belt. Well, what happened to the other half of Tiamat, this giant watery planet? Well, according to the tablets, it was bounced over past the orbit of Mars and went into orbit there and then over millions of years coalesced into the Earth. And this is why, I don't know if I have a slide here, but uh, so now we get our, the solar system as we know it now. Um, I didn't have the slide, but uh, they, some of you who keep up with scientific uh, information probably are well aware that they found all kinds of traces of Martian life and meteorites and and rocks and things here on the earth and they there's even a, a theory that uh, life on earth began because we were seeded here from mars but i think the sumerian explanation of tiamat the watery planet bringing all of this water and uh, uh one cell organisms etc cetera, etc cetera, and then coalescing in the earth also explains the earth also explains why half the earth is water uh, you know, you've got, uh, when I was a kid, we were taught the moon pulled away from the earth. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll talk about that, too. Now, we know that uh, we've got some strange moons in our solar system. Uh, early on, Carl Sagan, along with some Russian scientists, were convinced that Phobos, uh, one of the moons of Mars, was a artificial object. And as he said, a natural satellite cannot be a hollow object. So remember that, because uh, we're going to get back to hollow object when we get to our own familiar satellite, the moon. Here is uh, Iapetus, which really just fascinates me. This is a close-up from one of the space probes. And it's got this wall or ridge all around the thing, you know. I don't know about you, but it reminds me of Kong Island. <laughs> you know, you got King Kong on one side. Everybody else on the other, but it's a, it's a very odd place. Uh, and, uh, and also you notice the comparison. It looks eerily like the Death Star <laughs> from Star Wars. And then when the, when the sun's just right, it's, it's also known as the uh, yin-yang planet because, look, it forms the, uh, the ancient symbol for yin and yang. Isn't that interesting? Um, now, we've got our own moon which is pretty odd. And uh, we could spend a whole, whole session on this, but I'm gonna just try to get through it pretty, pretty easy. Um, when one of the lunar modules uh, was cut loose and fell back onto the moon, NASA officials announced that the moon vibrated and rang like a bell for like eight hours or something like that, which would indicate that it may be hollow. And of course, when I was a kid in school, we were taught the moon's just this dead, airless world, maybe some volcanic activity, but no water, no uh, magnetic field, you know, nothing like that. And uh, now we know it's quite the opposite. You know, uh, the uh, 
uh, it, it's, uh, there is no volcanic activity, and this is really interesting because I, I don't think I have the slide, but I have a, uh, uh, some newspaper clippings of uh, Armstrong uh, and the guys that were going to land on the moon, and the day before, they reported back that they had seen a bright light emanating from the, I think it's Aristarchus crater, and uh, this actually made it into the mainstream news media because at that time they were saying, well, there's volcanic activity there, and of course, after we got there, we found out there is no volcanic activity, so what's making the bright light in the crater? And of course, that Nobody ever answered that because we don't talk about that. Uh, so, uh, originally the idea was, and I was taught, that the moon tore away from the earth. And uh, that's what created the giant hole, which is now the Pacific Ocean. But when we got to the moon, we found out that the uh, mineral composition is nowhere near that of rocks on the earth. So, in other words, it came from somewhere else. And let me see if we've got a... Uh, so now the latest theory is the big whack, you know. And this is really interesting because now they're saying, well, somebody came through, body, a body, came through and struck uh, uh, the earth and broke up and created the moon, which is, sounds very similar to what the Sumerians were trying to tell us, right? And uh, the big whack, of course, explains uh, supposedly the, the anomalies on the moon. I love that word, anomaly. That's a scientific expression for WTF. <laughs> <laughs> we got things like the shard. We don't know what this is, but it juts a mile above the moon's surface and is photographed. And my little clumsy fingers are kind of bad, but well, I. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. There's the shard. And don't worry about the. There's some little marks up in here. Don't worry. Those are registration marks. The key thing is the shard. We don't know what this is, but it, uh, it appears to be artificial. Now, we've got all these shots coming from NASA photographs that are really fascinating. We've got this uh, cigar-shaped object jutting out over a crater. We've got another cigar-shaped object apparently flying across the surface of the moon. You can actually see the the shadow under it. So there's stuff going on on the moon, our own, our own nearest world that we're not being told about and we don't really know about. I love this one too. This is another NASA photo. And you can see what appears to be like maybe a big round boulder that rolled off of, the, of this uh, crater. Oops, get back. This crater over here. Uh, and of course, this is all blown up and it's a slide. But in the original photograph that I've seen, uh, the tracks not only roll down this side of the crater, but they come up the inside of the crater. So, now wait a minute, I can understand a natural object may be coming loose and rolling down the crater, but how do you roll up a crater if you don't have any uh, mo mo motive power? And uh, then you look up, up above, and I don't know if this thing's even working, there we go. Right up here, see, and you can see some more tracks. And uh, these, the bottom ones kind of look like treads. The top one looks like tire tracks or something. And it, this is it's not just, these are not just exceptions. These are the rules. Because uh, there was, uh, when I prepared my book, Alien Agenda, uh, I studied a NASA publication that was put out uh, in the late 60s, but before we went to the moon. And it was all about moon anomalies. And they traced all this back into the, the times of Kepler and and uh, Galileo and the very first uh, telescopes. And since that time, there have been people who have seen structures, have seen lights moving, have seen clouds of something moving across the moon. So we don't even know about our own uh, closest body. And of course then, uh, as I mentioned about occult and the moon uh, eclipsing the sun, the moon is at just the right distance from the earth that when it uh, eclipses the sun, it completely covers the, uh, the corona of the sun. All right, so now keeping that in mind, and then you try to figure out, well, where did the moon come from? One side of the moon is heavier than the other side. It's got a denser layer, okay? And it's got uh, matter and material rocks on there that predate the moon and the earth. 
uh, and uh, the Earth is, uh, I forget now, I think it's about 8 billion years old, they say, and some of these rocks they found were like 10 and 12 billion years old, according to their best estimate. So, what do we got here? We got a body coming through space, and you got bugs on the windshield. <laughs> All right? It's picking up stuff as it's going through space, which accounts for the fact that one side of the moon is heavier. Um, so here, here's the Earth. Here comes the moon. It goes past the Earth. It's caught in the gravitational field. And it comes back. Okay, I can see that. Now, so uh, we should have a moon that's in an elliptical orbit and kind of wobbling around as it's captured and put into orbit around the Earth. But that's not what we have. We have a body that's in almost a near-perfect circular orbit right around the equator of the Earth. And it's stationary. One side's always facing the Earth. Whoa. And it's at just the proper distance to cover the corona of the sun when there's an eclipse. How can that be? Isaac Asimov, famous astronomer and science fiction writer, he said the moon shouldn't be where it is. But it is. And this leads to our circular thinking, see, because we all know there's no such thing as aliens. But we know the, men, the moon's been around forever, and we know then somebody must have parked it there to be in this kind of position. But we know it wasn't us, and we know there's no such thing as aliens, so we just won't talk about it. <laughs> On the moon, they claim to have found pyramids. Now I think we're beginning to get uh, to the truth of some of this stuff. Because also on Mars, in the Sidonia region, you have pyramids. Pyramids seems to be a, a, a common structure. Was that a, was that a real photo that went fire to this? The moon? Yeah. No, I think that was an illustration. And, now, and then, of course, we get to our own planet, and we got all these anomalies. I won't get into all of them, but up here you've got, a, obviously, a, a, a manufactured axe that's found in rock sediment that's like a million years old. You've got handprints in this rock. Uh, you've got these round balls of Guatemala, they're perfectly round. You all know about the crystal skulls and, and how odd they are. The vitrified forest, uh, fortresses uh, in Scotland, the Baghdad battery, okay, that shows that they were able to generate a little bit of electricity even back at the time of the Sumerians. But the common theme throughout all of this is flight. If there's pyramids on the moon and Mars, if there's artificial things on the moon and on Iapetus and on Phobos, then somebody's traveling around the universe. Then you go and check out every ancient culture on the world. And the common denominator is they talk about the gods that came from the sky and they're flying around. Now, uh, you know, I think you can understand today if somebody with a jet pack come and lands in your front yard, you're just going to go, hey, who the hell are you? Okay? No big deal because you know man can fly. But you've got to understand, in, in, in 1906, uh, when the Wright brothers flew, and here's a little inside story on the news media, the New York Times, who had reporters at Kitty Hawk, refused to run the story because their science editors told them man can't fly. There's no such thing as heavier than air flight. You just can't do it. And it was uh, more than a year after the flight at Kitty Hawk that the New York Times, our newspaper of record, finally got around <laughs> to telling people that it, it worked. And that was only after that the French invited the Wright brothers over to Europe and they took their flying machine over there and they flew it all around. And it made the European media and they made a big deal about it. And finally this state old New York Times says, well, okay. And they finally ran the story. So see, this, there's so much going on, and we don't get told about it. But flight all over the world, uh, from the ancient Vedas, uh, uh, the flying uh, dragons of the Chinese, the flying boats of the Egyptians, the flying shields of the Romans, and they're all talking about this. So, hey, something's going on, all right? This is not something that just started in 1947. Uh, you've got other uh, oddities like the Antithicara mechanism, which they found on a, a sunken Greek uh, galley 
back in the early 1900s, and they couldn't figure out what it was. It was all kind of crested over and everything. But since then, they've cleaned it up. They looked in there. There's all these little gears and all kinds of things. It's a computer. It's an astrological computer. And then uh, down in uh, Columbia, you've got these little trinket things that everybody says, oh, they're made out of gold, by the way. And of course, we all know about the importance of gold. And they say, uh, well, this is, uh, these are just uh, bees uh, or some kind of insect and just a stylized thing, you know. But some Germans got together and built a model, and guess what? It flew just fine. It's a flying airplane is what it is. So we've got all of this evidence lying all around the world that nobody's paying any attention to except us. And that brings us then to the question of Atlantis. And, of course, Atlantis, the idea that there was this great civilization somewhere that, that got destroyed and uh, predates our own history. The argument now is, where was Atlantis? And you get arguments that say it was a big island in the middle of the uh, Atlantic. You've got ruins found off the coast of Cuba. They say, no, it's down near Bimini. Uh, you've, down at the bottom, you see the star. They, there's a, one theory that says Atlantis was actually Antarctica before there was a pole shift and that the Earth tilted and it froze over, and that's where it was. Uh, and, of course, you've got more conventional people saying, no, it was the island of Santorini before a big uh, volcano exploded, and uh, no, it was the island of Cyprus. Uh, there's even one theory that said, oh, no, it was in the South China Sea. All right, and of course, then you get into the competing ancient mythological things of Atlantis and Mu and all of these places. And frankly, folks, I think we're dealing with the blind men and the elephant, if you remember that story. They sent the blind men and the elephant to the zoo because they all wanted to experience the elephant. So they got there, and one of them had grabbed him around the leg, and he said, oh, the elephant's like a big post. And the other one had his tail, he said, no, it's like a rope. And the other one had his nose, and he said, no, it's like a big hose. Another one had his ear, said, no, it's like a big fan. Another one's pressing on his side and said, no, the elephant's like a wall. They were all right, but they were all wrong. It was more than all of that. And for my money, I think we are dealing with that there was a planet-wide civilization, very highly sophisticated, using technologies that we're only just now becoming aware of, much less understanding. And that what happens here is you have these scientists fighting over Atlantis, and uh, they all have a piece of it. And unfortunately, that's all we've been left is pieces. And then it gets worse than that, because as we go on, you're going to find out these pieces are being hidden from you. They're doing everything they can to keep you from knowing about all of this prehistory because uh, knowledge is indeed power. Um, you've got these giants' bones, and I've got a whole bulging file on stories from the 1800s where they were discovering uh, huge giant bones. And when I say giant, some of them are kind of normal giant, and some of them are really giant. Uh, and, uh, of course, you can find pictures like this on the Internet. And, of course, the naysayers will tell you, well, they're all phony. They're all just doctored photographs. And I'm sure that some of them probably are, but not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> we see, we see uh, you got David and Goliath. So you got ancient stories of giants. Uh, you got this tall cowboy guy, whoever he is, from, uh, that probably looks like the 20s or 30s. And then you got these modern people. And so, hey, giants are not that big a deal. They're here. Uh, but, of course, we're talking about really immense people. Uh, and, again, you've got all these stories dating all the way back about uh, giants that are found. And so what happens to them? Well, it seems like that invariably the Smithsonian Institution shows up and collects it all up. And then it just kind of like disappears into a black hole. It's not there. We don't know what happened to all of that. And we're not only talking about giant bones found in the Middle East, but South America, Central America, the Middle West, the Midwest. There were Indian mounds found, and there were apparently giant people here living in North America. Um, and again, you've got some of these pictures, and some of them are kind of questionable, like the guys with the skull. 
<laughs> but then you've got the fella up here story showing this uh, bone that he's found, and I think that one's probably legitimate. Uh, and again, what you have to understand about the Smithsonian is, is that you probably know it as the world's foremost uh, archaeological repository, the center of science, which is true, but what you don't know is, is that it is an arm of the United States government. The government owns the Smithsonian and has since the late 1800s. In the Phoenix Gazette of uh, 19, oh, what does that say, nine? 1909, it gave a very detailed story of Egyptian artifacts found in the north end of the Grand Canyon. And uh, it even goes into great detail about how the Smithsonian was called in and that they built uh, huge platforms and put cranes on there and they uh, lifted out of these caves these uh, Egyptian artifacts. And, of course, how does that fit in with our known history? And it, and it doesn't. Okay? But then again, now you go to the Smithsonian and say, well, what about all those finds in 1909? And they say, what finds? We don't know anything about that. That never happened. And yet, even today, you go to the north end of the Grand Canyon, you go find out there's pretty good sections up there that are now barred to visitors. You're not supposed to go in there. They say, oh, well, <clears throat> danger of cave-in. Or, you know, maybe the river's a little too wild. So you can't go there. And yet, they've got names like the Tower of Set, the Tower of Ra, the Horus Temple, the Osiris Temple, and the Isis Temple. That's, whoa, where, where did these names come from if there was nothing to this story about Egyptian artifacts in the Grand Canyon. Uh, I was pretty fascinated to find out about the Osirian. How many of you all are aware of the Osirian? Not very many? Okay. Well, I wasn't either, so don't feel bad. I don't know if you can see this, but oh, this stupid little thing is not really working. Up here at the top, way up here, that is Seti's Temple at Abydos in Egypt. Okay, so I went to Seti's temple. I was real interested in that and seeing what they had going there. And one of the uh, attendants said, well, have you seen the Osirian? I said, well, what's that? Well, out behind Seti's temple and buried way down is the Osirian, which is this series of finely cut stone blocks uh, intricately laid upon each other. Uh, it's another one of these cases where they are so finely cut that they just fit right together so closely that you really can't even put a piece of paper in there between them. And as far as I could tell, there was no mortar. Yes, sir. Can you make a comment? Mm -hmm. uh, I was there a few years ago. My guide, Bob, <laughs> took me to the temples above, and I said, I want to see the Osirian. I said, what's that? And this is a guy who's trained in Egypt to be a guy. Right? right. I said, it's just down there. He said, no, we don't want to go there. Let's go on. I said, no, 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 I want to see this. We walked down there. He was amazed. He had not even he seen it. He didn't know about it. He right. was amazed. His guide in Egypt had not even <laughs> heard about it. Well, and that's the thing. I was very fortunate because uh, uh, when I was there, uh, it was an exceptionally dry period. And the Osirian uh, actually had, uh, I don't know if you can see it on this one. Uh, see where the little door is and it looks real dark down there? That's because there's probably a little bit of water standing there. Usually it's underwater. But the time I was there, uh, there we go, some other pictures of it. Uh, the, and there's a, there's a crudely built wooden ladder leading down to it, but they had two by fours across it to block. You know, you weren't supposed to go down there. But uh, in Egypt, in a little bakshis will get you through, you know. And the guy actually <laughs> pulled the two by fours off so we could go down there and look around. And while we're down there, another of the guards is shouted and came over and said, you can't be here. And we paid him a little back cheese. And we kept going and shooting some photographs. And then finally we hear a big angry shout. And here's probably the head guard. And he's got a machine gun. So, <laughs> so I listened to him. He said, you can't be down there. And, and I think he was just mad because he didn't get the back cheese. You know? <laughs> So they ran us out of there, but that's the whole deal. And just like the gentleman said, they, they don't want to even acknowledge it's there because it obviously is not built by the Egyptians. And that means there was somebody there with some real sophisticated equipment and knowledge, architectural skills before the Egyptians. 
And that's the thing you have to realize, why there's such a controversy. You may have heard um, John Anthony West last night talking about the uh, water erosion on the Great Pyramid and on the Sphinx and the fact that uh, there's such an argument and disagreement between the geologists who say, yeah, it's, it was here 12,000 years ago, and the Egyptologists say, oh, no, 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 you're just, your dating's all wrong. And I'll tell you what the deal is. Without the ancient culture of, uh, of Egypt and now all that mythology, uh, Egypt is a dirt poor third world nation. So Egyptology, the ancient Egyptians and, uh, you know, Pharaohs and the Queen Cleopatra and the, the whole schmear, that's their bread and butter. And I understand this, but it's not right. It's not the truth. Uh, and of course, I'm sure you've seen these, uh, these, the technology that they were using, these tubes connected to the jed pillar, which was their source of power <laughs> with a cord. And you got these little things and they've got what looks like a snake in there, but I think that's just representing energy. Um, and the one at the top's the photograph, the, the complete drawings over here. And it's tough to get a view of these because let me tell you something, this is not at one place. I saw at least three or four of these same uh, uh, engravings, but they're always in a narrow little hallway and you can't really get back to, uh, to get, you have to really gonna have to have a good camera and some good uh, knowledge of photography to be able to get a shot of it. Uh, you're gonna love this one. We were in Sackmitt's tomb. Those hands are my wife, Carol, and she's shorter than I am. So she's holding her camera up over her head, trying to get a picture of the little statue of Sekhmet. And I want to tell you something. I'm not the most uh, feely, touchy-feely person in the whole world, you know. You know, show me. You know, set it a fire, see what it does. I don't know. And yet, I want to tell you something. In the Sekhmet's tomb, uh, I was even impacted by the energy that is in that place. So Carol was trying to take a picture, and uh, she said, hey, it sucked all the energy out of my camera. I said, it won't work. And that camera never worked again the rest of the trip. Okay, and I thought, yeah, yeah, segment sucked your energy. <laughs> it sounds like a joke, you know. But we get home, and one of the other people that were with us sent me this photograph. They were behind Carol. And they took this photograph at the exact moment that you can see this energy trail trailing away from her camera. Now, now those of you who know about photography, you know that if there was a light source on the camera and it would start it up way up here and you pull it down, then yeah, you could get a streak on there, you know. But she never got higher than that. That's the energy being sucked out of her camera. It's amazing. Uh, here's an ancient gate. Uh, in, in, uh, outside uh, a Giza wall and uh, you notice a little figure on top kind of looks uh, eerily like a, a small alien gray, right? By the way, <laughs> after I came back and started talking about this gate, they took it down and uh, I hope they didn't destroy it. Uh, you got places like Karnak, uh, thousands of these stones over in uh, France uh, and see, you've probably never heard of this. There's just all these weird places. Baalbek, here's, that's a good one too. And if you study Sitchin's material, he has uh, said that these ancient tablets talk about Baalbek as basically the point where these Anunnaki gods came and went. And so the theory is these huge stones down here uh, were a platform, a landing platform for craft. And... Uh, um, the, the bigger stones on top and then the wall over here, they built a Roman city on top of this. So for the longest time, everybody thought that the Romans had made all this, but the Romans had no way of dealing with rocks of that, of stones of that size. Uh, here's an obelisk that uh, they had queried, but never got placed in position. And you can see the size of it with all these people. And I noticed the other night at the panel, they were talking about the, the giant rocks and our giant blocks of stone and, and uh, do we have the, uh, uh, the means to uh, lift things like that today. And so when I was writing my book, Our Occulted History, I really dug into that. And here's what I found out. There are perhaps today 
two cranes in the world, I think one of them's in Britain and one of them's, another one's in Europe, that might be capable of lifting a uh, hundred tons rocks or whatever, but here's the clincher. Neither one of them are mobile. They can lift things, but they can't move them anywhere. <laughs> and they, these style, stones at Baalbek, and uh, just like uh, Stonehenge, and just like other places, they were quarried miles away. So lifting them's one thing. You can always argue that you, you roll them up on rollers and, you know, keep running around with logs and, and get 2,000 people pushing on it and maybe moving around somewhere, but can, can you lift it? And, if you, and even if you can lift it, can you move it somewhere? So we're right back where we started from, mysteries. Now, uh, some of you know about the Ed Lickenskiles. Uh, the Coral Castle in Florida. You all know about that? Okay, well, you ought to look into that. That's a fascinating thing. This guy, he was an old guy, and he, by himself, built this huge uh, exhibit out of these huge stones that he would carve out and then place in these various positions, and nobody ever could tell how he did that. And uh, the closest thing we have is that uh, some kids were playing nearby at one time when a truck came and delivered some of these giant stones. And uh, Ed told the drivers and said, go on, go get some lunch and come back after lunch. And they did while they were gone. The kids said they saw him and he had what looked like ice cream cones in his hand, little, uh, little conical objects, you know. And when the guys came back after lunch, all this stuff was out of the truck and, and up, you know. And the only thing, the only clue we have as to what Oled was up to is that he did say one time that he knew the secrets of the ancient Egyptians. And so then you get things like the uh, Coral Castle. And then I was also flabbergasted to learn about the giant heads on Easter Island. Okay, and we have all know about those, and they all already have caused so much controversy and so much wonderment because, you know, those huge heads, and you have a primitive people there whose, I guess, their basic tools were deer antlers or stones or something, you know, a stick, uh, and they carved these giant heads and placed them in there. But then I find out that there's bodies under there. It's not just the heads. You've got a huge body down there that's sometimes two and three times bigger, longer than the head. Now, how come we don't hear more about that? Well, because somebody, on somebody's orders, they, when they excavated these things, they came back in and filled them back in. They don't want you to know that there's this stuff going on. And when you go home and tell all your friends and or neighbors and or relatives, okay, they're going to go, what? You know, they, they're not even going to believe you because they never see this stuff. Go Blakey Tepe. I won't go into too much of that because I think my friend Linda Howe took care of some of this. But that's, again, a fantastic place, dating back 12,000 years with intricate designs and, and uh, all kinds of things. They call it the Turkish uh, Stonehenge. And it predates Stonehenge by 7,000 years. You know, well, hey, that alone leaves out the Egyptians, right? Because Egyptians only go back 5,000 years. And their uh, intricate carvings, etchings, and, and, and keep in mind, Gobleki Tepe is just now being excavated and, and studied. Um, we know about all the strange skulls found all around the world, particularly in South America. And then that got me to thinking because I know at one time I was at the Charlottenburg Castle there in Berlin and actually saw the real Nefertiti. And oh, my God, it is beautiful. It is incredible. And, of course, she's got this high hat on, like so many of them did, and uh, it makes you wonder if perhaps these high conical hats and, you know, the thing like the, the, the popes wear now is ceremonial, but they used to wear those all the time, was this to cover up their tall, non-human skull. And, of course, some of the, the late Lloyd Pye. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, and he definitely deserves your applause because good old Lloyd, boy, he stuck right to it. He fought all the way to the end, uh, trying to show that his skull was non-human. In fact, uh, it, uh, I, I don't want to get too conspiratorial, but 
I couldn't help but wonder that, you know, it seems like he was just about on, the, on a breakthrough there to prove that this was a non-human or at least partially non-human skull and then he died of cancer. Um, so it makes you, it definitely raises the issue of did we come from somewhere else? Uh, and again, not only is there uh, evidence all around the world of flying machines and people flying through the air, but you've got all these carvings and drawings and everything else that just, quite frankly, do not appear to be human. And uh, being a kind of a cartoonist artist, I mean, I can understand taking liberties with the human figure and making cartoony type things, but uh, uh, generally you try to stick with what you know. and. These things are just pretty, uh, pretty unusual. So this shows that, th that there has been vegetation. There's been beings here on this planet. Um, and of course, we all remember 2001 Space Odyssey and uh, how that, uh, it's, it's, so the concept, actually, the idea that, that mankind has been pulled up by his bootstraps and kicked along uh, is actually n not very uh, new. Uh, we've kind of figured this out for a long time. We just didn't know the who's, why's, and wherefores. And I think we're getting that with the Sumerian tablets. <laughs> Even show them in cartoons now, you know. Say, boy, they're going to get a kick out of this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I have thought about that. Have you thought about this? You know, a thousand years from now, you got somebody digging around here, and they find a Coke bottle. What's this? Ah, uh, obviously... Uh, some kind of ancient artifact alluding to the feminine goddess. <laughs> we don't know what we don't know. So the story in the Sumerian tablets seems to be more and more true. And basically, again, we find that they say that uh, 432,000 years ago, and that's being kind of particular. I'm not sure I'd put that fine a date on it. It could be anywhere from 300,000 to 500,000. But something happened, and somebody came here, and things started happening. And they even tell you how that they created this worker race. They took the uh, seed of a Anunnaki male, and they impregnated the egg of an Anunnaki female, and then she carried it to term, and then they, by Caesarean section, they... Um, delivered what they call the Adama, the Adam, <laughs> the first human, the, the earth man. And, uh, and I think that it's pretty obvious <laughs> that there's been intervention somehow or another. But the thing I want to stress on you, and I want you to stress on your friends and our relatives, uh, is that nobody's saying that anyone, cre that aliens created us. They didn't create us. Okay, they simply improve the breed, just like we do with horses and sheep and cows and dogs and cats, okay, except instead of breeding like we do with animals uh, or have up till recently, they actually went in and, and manipulated the DNA and uh, created their Adama, their Adam, their worker race. Um, and interestingly enough, according to those tablets, they had the same ethical arguments that we're having. And some of them were saying, well, it's not right for us. to. We're not God. We can't play God. We can't create anything. It's not up to us to create life. And their science officer, Inky, he argued, well, we're, we're not creating anything. We're just improving the breed. And we need these workers to do all the drudge work. And uh, we need to cut down on the work shortages and strikes and stuff because uh, all these Anunnaki, they said, hey, we signed up to be astronauts. We didn't sign up to be gold miners and digging in the dirt. So, so they, that argument finally won out, and they said, okay, we're going we're gonna to create this race. And so by tweaking the DNA, they came up with uh, modern man. And uh, then you all heard Michael Tellinger uh, talk about these circles in Africa. Here's some of them that I'll show you, so we'll kind of zip on through this. Uh, the, I even believe, I really do, I'm beginning to really agree with Tellinger that uh, they probably have discovered Inky's African laboratory there at this place they call Adam's Calendar. 
because it matches the descriptions that we find in the ancient uh, Sumerian tablets, and it clearly said that his laboratory was in the Abzug, which has been translated to be Africa. Uh, this is really fascinating to me. Uh, they, they're in the, a lot of, most of them are in the exact configuration of a magnetron, which is uh, what you use to generate uh, energy. And uh, I was really fascinated that when they went 600 feet down, they found the average temperature outside the circles was 42 degrees Fahrenheit, but inside the circles, it went up to 136 degrees. So these circles somehow, just by their geometric configuration, are generating energy and power. And uh, we, need to, we need to figure this out so we can stop burning fossil fuel and, and killing ourselves with nuclear energy. Uh, the Great Pyramid, this uh, Dr. Michael Barson, Drexel University, he says that, uh, that the Great Pyramid is not even made out of limestone. It just appears to be limestone, but it's jack actually a poor geopolymer concrete. Now, this brings up a whole new theory about creation of these pyramids because the big argument is how could these Egyptians drag all these huge stones through the desert and how could they pile them up and make them into such perfect pyramids? Well, maybe they didn't. Maybe they just built uh, forms and, and poured it. That could explain this. It also could explain why that uh, some of these, uh, I think last night they were talking about a pyramid that they found buried and that uh, they didn't know what it was made out of. Maybe it was made out of this polymer. But uh, again, we find that the, the common denominator are these pyramids all around the world. Mexico, China. This, this photograph down here was taken uh, about the time of World War II by pilots flying over China. Uh, today, they got, they got trees planted on it and they're trying to act like, no, that's not, that's just a hill. <laughs> and of course, we know about the crop circles and some of them get really weird, like, like this one right here at Shilbolton, uh, which uh, seemed to be a response to, on the right, we have a binary code message that was sent from uh, Puerto Rico in 1974 and um, without trying to get into too much detail, it gave a, it gave a DNA breakdown. It shows down here you see a, a figure of a human that says we kind of look like this. Right below that you see the little uh, kind of brownish uh, objects. That represents the solar system with the big sun and then uh, Mercury, Mars, and then you can see the one lifted up above. That represents we're, we're here. We're on the third planet from the sun. We're, we're on from the Earth. So in 2001, we get this, looks like a copy of this uh, uh, Puerto Rico message back, except it's a little bit different. It's got different D DNA sequence. I don't know why this thing's not working. But, and then when you see the human, you see something with a great big head and a little bitty body. It kind of looks like a, a deal. And then uh, over here, you see their solar system, and they're on the... Uh, fourth, fifth, sixth planet, seventh planet, they, they, they really spread out over there. And apparently they are trying to send us a message. And of course, this hit and went away. Unless you know about it, unless you're a pack rat like me and keep files, you just forget about it or don't know, ever know about it. And then they send us this face that is done in the crop. And it looks fairly human. I don't know. Nobody's certain on whether they're trying to say we look like this or hey, this is what you look like. You know. But uh, they also li also like this one. That was uh, this was 2002. Again, you have a very alien-looking face uh, with uh, a binary code message, and the message says, "Beware the bearers of false gifts and their broken promises. Much pain, but still time." Believe there's good out there. We oppose deception, conduit closing, whatever that ignomatic message means. You can make what you want to out of that, but here we are, folks. There, there's people, they're here, they've been here, been here all along, they're still here, and uh, this is what we're dealing with. So this really, I think, pretty much answers the question, did our ancestors come from space? Uh, yes, and because we see evidence that they were not only on the Earth, but in our whole solar system. Well, now the question is, well, did they all leave at some point? 
or some, at least some of them still here? How do we answer that? Well, you go look at the historical record. If the historical record is as we were taught, just a slow evolutionary climb from uh, hunter gatherers to cave people to uh, farmers to city states to empires, you know, then that ought to be the historical record and that's it. But no, what we find is that throughout history, from the Vedas, from the, from the Sumerian tablets, from the Bible, Ezekiel, the fiery wheel, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar and his, uh, his fiery furnace, his little gold thing where somebody appeared, okay? Uh, we've got evidence of uh, alien uh, manipulation uh, and uh, presence here uh, all throughout our written history. So that means that at least some of them are still here.